Hello everybody, I'm uh, Valentin Schneider, I'm a graduate software engineer at ARM and today I'll be talking about virtual machines and interrupts and modeling that with TLA plus and plus call. So uh, this presentation is mostly split into two big parts, so after a bit uh, brief context it's mostly going to be bringing up technical details of having virtual machines and interrupts uh, on ARM platforms and then the other chunk will be about uh, how I actually model them. So for the context, um, Kathleen Marinas, who wished he could be here but couldn't make it, uh, he's the tech lead for the Linux kernel team at ARM, and he's been using TLA Plus to model a few components of the Linux kernel. So uh, one, the AC allocator here is related to memory management, and the two others are spin-lock algorithms. And the good thing with that is uh, he actually found that uh, some properties of the algorithms were violated. So it's fairly rare kind of cases, but still it's a sort of a success story for TLA plus on the Linux kernel. Now for my part, uh, the interesting thing is uh, David mentioned picking up uh, an engineer in the street and tossing it up TLA plus, and that's exactly what happened for me. So I was told uh, we have this infrastructure in the Linux kernel called KVM that allows us to run virtual machines or we also call them guests, and the system that runs them is the host. Uh, and there's quite a few bugs that can happen on that, and it would be really nice if we could uh, have a formal specification of that. So I worked on that. And we also have the Geek, since we need to have interrupts, and the Geek is ARM's programmable interrupt controller. And in a sentence, I could describe it as the gateway between the CPUs in the system and the interrupts. And uh, as an appetizer, I can kind of give an insight of what can go wrong. So when we run virtual machines, uh, they can break. So if the virtual machine crash, it's annoying, but it's OK. If the virtual machine crashes the host, so the system that is running on, it's much worse. So we need to prevent that. Uh, otherwise, we can have a buggy hypervisor. So it doesn't deliver the interrupts to the virtual machine and prevents the uh, correct uh, behavior of the virtual machine. So now it's going to be pretty much uh, computer science and computer architecture for, I hope, not more than 10 minutes. Uh, so the geek, as I said, stands between the CPUs in the system and the uh, interrupt sources. And the reason for that is our CPUs only have one or two interrupt lines that, when raised, actually interrupt uh, their execution. But we want to have several hundreds of different sources of interrupts. So that's where our interrupt controller comes into play. We connect all of our interrupt sources to our interrupt controller, and it has a sort of internal database that holds an internal state for all the sources, and it's called the distributor. So the distributor knows when it needs to raise one of those CPU lines so that will interrupt the CPU, and the CPU in its interrupt handling code will just interact with the geek to know a bit more. So we have CPU interfaces per CPU with some registers that can be accessed to get some information. Um, so for the geek, we have three types of interrupts to distinguish. We have per CPU hardware interrupts. So for instance, CPU timers would raise these kind of interrupts. We have global hardware interrupts. So interrupts from hardware that are not tied to any CPU, uh, network card that receives the packet would raise this kind of interrupt. And we have SGI, so per CPU software generated interrupts, which are interrupts that can be triggered by the CPU for inter-processor communication. Right, so now I can give a bit more details about what goes on in distributor and this internal state for interrupts that I mentioned. So it pretty much boils down to two bits of information. There's the pending state and the active state. So an interrupt is said pending when it can be signaled to the CPU and it's waiting to be serviced by a CPU. Uh, active state is that it can be signaled as it's being handled by your CPU. So the exact transitions in this state machine that have different combinations of uh, these two states can be caused firstly by the hardware. So uh, we've seen before that we have those signals coming in and they're just Boolean signals, so zero and ones, uh, and they can cause transitions in these state machines. Uh, we have different possible transitions depending on if the interrupt is sensitive to edge transitions or level transitions, but it's just a few changes in actual transitions that then can be taken and it doesn't change the actual fundamentals. And we have transitions caused by software. So those 
uh, change this active state. And that's when the CPU interacts with the geek. So when a CPU is interrupted, the first thing it will do, it will acknowledge the interrupt so that it can know the exact interrupt ID that caused it to be interrupted. And this will set the active bit. And once the interrupt is done handling, uh, the CPU is done handling this interrupt, it can deactivate the interrupt, which will clear this active state. Uh, and as a side note, so individual interrupts can be entirely disabled so that they no longer affect the system. And that's uh, useful for different stages of operation in a Linux system. So we've seen these variations uh, in the state machine of the internal state of the interrupt, but I haven't talked about how do we exactly decide to interrupt a CPU to give it uh, an interrupt. So the exact conditions are that an interrupt must be enabled, that it must be in a pending state, and that it must have a high enough priority. So that's my cue to introduce interrupt priority. So each interrupt can be given a priority that's programmable, and then we have two concepts. We have the priority mask. So at each CPU interface, we can program a priority mask so that any interrupt of a given priority will be masked, and so they will never be signaled to the CPU. And more importantly, we have the running priority. So when a CPU acknowledges an interrupt, it updates the running priority to the priority of that interrupt. And what it means is that once that's changed, we will never be able to signal an interrupt of priority lesser or equal to that value. Um, we can also split the, the second phase of the interrupt handling into actually two more steps. So I have the, I've presented the acknowledged and then the deactivation. And we can actually split the activation into two steps. We have the priority drop, so clearing this running priority, which allows the geek to signal more interrupts to the CPU. But the active state is still up. So what this means is this particular interrupt won't be signaled again to the CPU. And then when we are actually done with the interrupt, we can deactivate it, which is just clearing this active state. Uh, so the reason why we uh, want to have this split is uh, that it's useful for threaded IOQs, which I'll let you read more about offline, and virtual machines, which I'll present just after this. So virtual machines, we need interrupts in virtual machines as well, because uh, we want to run software that could be handling uh, interrupts. Uh, one way we could go about it is we could just uh, trap whatever instruction interacts with the geek. So at the hypervisor level, uh, when we see that the guest is trying to access the geek, we just trap it and hold that in the hypervisor, and we essentially be emulating the geek in software. But that would be really slow, because interrupts are the lifeblood of a system. And so if we just emulate everything that happens, there's a lot of overhead in that. Uh, that's what happens on the Raspberry Pi, because it does not have any hardware support for this kind of stuff. So the geek has some virtualization extensions that allows us to speed things up in that regard. So what the virtual geek gives us, which is what we call the virtualization extensions, is a virtual distributor. So this is a distributor that the hypervisor can entirely control. And it consists of registers that we can read and write to. So the hypervisor can set up those list registers, as they are called. And then the guest will interact with virtual CPU uh, interface registers. So they are real hardware registers, but instead of interacting with a distributor, they will interact with the list registers. So we have this isolation from the physical distributor, but we still have hardware that can help us speed up things going on with the virtual machines. Uh, now, we can be wondering, how really do we decide to put an interrupt in the list registers? So there are uh, yeah, three sources uh, of virtual interrupts. So one could be uh, QMU. So when you are emulating a system, you can use QMU with KVM and you can decide to trigger an interrupt just to see how your system reacts. So it's a manual input. So that will end up creating an interrupt in those list registers. Uh, you could also have the virtual machine code that tries to trigger an interrupt. And so you would trap that and eventually write an interrupt in those registers. Uh, we have a special case, which is where this priority drop and interrupt deactivation split uh, is useful is that sometimes we have a real physical interrupt that is triggered, but we want the virtual machine to handle it. So for instance, we want to give access uh, a, a piece of hardware to the virtual machine. So in that case, we just do a priority drop on that interrupt. So it stays active, but the hypervisor can still receive those interrupts. 
and then we let the guests handle it by writing a duplicate of this interrupt in the list registers. And the hardware helps us a bit by making sure that when the guest is done handling this interrupt, it also clears whatever state we had left in the distributor. So this is the big picture of interactions between hypervisor, guest, and geek. So the first thing we want to do before starting running a virtual machine or guest is that we restore the state of the geek. So we prepare something in the list registers so that whenever the guest tries to do some interrupt handling, it is a state uh, that we control. Then we can start running the guest, and the guest is free to execute some code or handle some of those virtual interrupts to interact with the list registers. And then for some reason, we'll have to exit the guest and go back to the hypervisor. So a common reason for going back to the hypervisor is uh, we have a physical interrupt to handle. So it can be handled by the guest. We have to go back to the hypervisor. Or for instance, the guest executed an instruction that must be trapped. So we must go back to the hypervisor to modify some state and then go back to the guest. So first thing we do when we exit the guest is we save whatever's in the list registers because the guest could have been modifying them in between. And then we look at why we exited the guest, if we need to do some additional processing. And then we can loop and cycle uh, going back to the guest and restoring and saving state. Uh, I've mentioned that one reason for exiting is that we have to handle a physical interrupt. So then we can have the cycle I've described where we start by acknowledging the interrupt, then doing the priority drop. If it's one of those interrupts we want to forward in a way to the guest, we leave them uh, just priority drop, so still active, but we lower the running priority. And then we inject it into the guest. So what this inject state means is just I modify some state in the hypervisor so that next time I'm about to run the guest, I make sure that I have some information in the list registers related to those interrupts. Uh, and same goes for if I have a manual interaction with QMU, I can interact with the hypervisor to say next time you run the guest, try to put this interrupt in the list registers. Uh, so now I can give a bit more insight at what exactly can go wrong. So if the guest is misbehaving or malicious, it can leave interrupts active. So if you have those interrupts uh, coming from this distributor, so real interrupts that are left active, that can be a problem because that means the guest can have an impact on the real system. And so we mu that mustn't happen. And as uh, for a buggy hypervisor, it could never write interrupts uh, in the list registers that we actually want the guest to see. So if the guest is relying on a certain interruptive function, it would essentially stop working. Or we could also, for some reason, write uh, entries in the list registers for interrupts that the guest should not be seeing. So now to try and spot those uh, problems, that's where the TLA plus model comes in. So for the KVM model, because I actually have two models. There's the KVM model, which is the hypervisor and the guest, so the software side of things, and the geek model, so modeling what are the actual possible interactions with the geek and the internal state. So for KVM, uh, it's written in PlusCall because KVM is software, and PlusCall makes uh, modeling software a whole lot easier, especially with all of the uh, uh, program counter handling. Uh, and the geek is uh, written in TL plus because it's hardware, which is a collection of independent steps that are relatively simple. So TL plus is more than enough to try and model that. Uh, so the problem with having these two models is I need to combine them in a way because the KVM model needs to interact with the geek and has those registers to access. And what I would like to write is just uh, this junction for my next step, which is either a KVM step or a geek step without touching either of the other variables. But that's not actually true because I want my KVM model to modify the internal state of the geek. But then from a software separation point of view, so writing the actual models, I like to have them separate so that I don't want to write the KVM model while being aware of what internal changes are going into inside the geek. And so a solution for that is just coming up with a communication channel. So two variables that the two models will use uh, to communicate. And it's simply just a common queue and a common acknowledge. So say my model, uh, my KVM model wants to acknowledge an interrupt. It will append this request in my common queue and then wait for something in the acknowledge. 
uh, having something in the command queue is an enabling condition for next step in my geek model. And so it will read what's going on in this queue. Uh, and here in this case, it's an acknowledge. So the internal modification would be setting the active uh, state and updating the running priority. And then I can clear the queue and write a reply on the acknowledge, which will be my interrupt ID that then the KVM model can use and can keep uh, going on with its other steps. Uh, so this is how it looks like. Uh, on the left, we have the plus call version for K the KVM model. And on the right, we have TLA plus for the geek. Uh, I have some more procedures and macros in there, but it's the simplified unrolled version that fits in one slide. So we have two labels, one where we just write to the queue for our request, and then we wait for something to happen on the acknowledge. And we know that our reply is going to be the interrupt ID. And the other side, we have our enabling condition on the queue, and then the handling with the modification of the internal state. How am I doing on time? Yeah. Uh, so this is an overview of uh, the next steps that can be taken by the geek model. Uh, we've seen the one with the communication channel. Uh, one of them is randomly asserting an interrupt line. So we have those uh, Boolean signals coming into the geek, zeros and ones, so I can flip them. Uh, I also have a pending signal. So I have interrupts uh, that can depend on edge or level transitions. So spotting level transitions is fairly simple. I just read what value is on the line. But for edges, I need to save a previous value. So I have a step where I just sample what is on this line and what was the previous value. Um, I can update the pending bit. So as I've said, it's entirely caused by uh, hardware transitions, so transitions of this signal. And so I can clear or set it for the interrupts in my system. And I can also update the interrupt signals. So the signals going to the CPU that will actually interrupt it, depending on the priorities and the pending states of the interrupts. Uh, and there's also maintenance interrupts, which I'll skip for now, but I can come back to them later. Now, for the KVM model, I needed to do a, a bit of magic because uh, I have two. I want to define two processes that do not run in parallel. But the thing is, this definition in Pascal would possibly make them run in parallel. But what actually happens is my hypervisor lets the guest run, and then the guest runs, and eventually it exits, and we go back to the hypervisor. So I need to have some sort of context switching between my um, processes. So what I have is I have a, a control variable that just defines for each CPU in my model what is its currently running task. And then I can switch that with an operator. And I have a helper that tells me, am I allowed to run the task? Well, yes, if there is a CPU that has it as its currently running task. Um, so plus call, when you use plus call, you get a TLA plus output in the end. And this is what it looks like. So you have a condition on the automatically, automatically generated program counter, and then whatever translation comes out of what you've written in plus call. Uh, so I have a, a script that modifies the output of plus call so that I always append this condition that my task must be allowed to run. And this is essentially how I make sure that I never have the hypervisor and the guest running at the same time on the same CPU. So in, in terms of how this is initialized, uh, I have the hypervisor thread that starts running, and eventually it will let the guest run, as we've seen in the big picture, where once it has set up the list registers, we can run the guest. Uh, one thing related to the communication channel, and that's not re really relevant in real life, is I can exit my guest and let the hypervisor thread run again in the middle of a transaction on my communication channel, because if the guest is in the middle of uh, requesting an access to a registers, I could still have some, some values in there. And so I must make sure that I cannot context switch when there's still something in my two variables. And yeah, so it's only relevant to the model because in real life, you will uh, preempt this guest either before or after the instruction that accesses the registers. So it's only really a, a model problem. So as an overview of the next possible states in the KVM model, I can execute an instruction. So this is the plus call output that I get, the TLA plus output of plus call that I get, uh, with the task enabled appended to it. And so this means I can either run a hypervisor thread or a guest thread on the given CPU. Uh, 
So for the hypervisor, it's what I've described before, saving whatever is in the list registers, rather actually that's <laughs> yeah, incorrect, but it's worthy. Uh, putting something in the list registers, running the guest, eventually exiting the guest, saving what's in the list registers, and looping. Uh, for the guest, I'm just waiting for a virtual signal to go up to handle it because uh, in this model, that's what I'm interested in. I don't care what else the virtual machines could be executing. Um, I have an explicit uh, step to exit the guest. So as I've said, when we have a physical interrupt to handle, we need to exit the guest to handle it in the hypervisor. So this is what this models. And when I'm running the hypervisor, I also need to explicitly branch to the interrupt handler. But yeah, that's a, a small detail. So now we can talk about the results of all of this. So in terms of property checks, for liveness properties, what I'm interested in is uh, correct interrupt delivery. So at some point, uh, I want to deliver an interrupt to a guest. So either because I have this physical interrupt that needs to be forwarded, or I have QMU that manually asked for an interrupt to be delivered. And what, by delivered, what I mean is not just appear in the list registers, but actually be currently handled by the guest. So it, uh, it's currently handling the interrupt. Uh, and I'm running out of memory when trying to verify this, so it's not very conclusive. But for safety properties, which is more about, I always have correct uh, values in my list registers, or the internal value, uh, variables of my hypervisor uh, are correct. I have a failure after 150 steps, and uh, it's about some loss of information related to software-generated interrupts. And it's actually a real bug, but <laughs> It's a bug that was found out while I was still working on the model. So it's, not a, it's a bug that has already been fixed, but it's a good milestone in that I do reproduce a bug that is actually in, a, in the real system. So in terms of overview of what I have in the end, I have a geek model that handles uh, different priorities, um, and it has these virtualization extensions. I have my KVM model with context switches between hypervisor and guest, uh, interrupts delivered to the guest, and instructions in the guest that can be trapped, so it causes me to go back to the hypervisor. But to put a bit of contrast on that, the Geek V2, so the version of the Geek that this is based on, is quite simpler than Geek V3 and uh, all the others that came after that. And so as I've said, the code has progressed since then, uh, because the, the Linux kernel has quite a bit of a, a big churn rate. So the next thing I'll be doing is updating the model to whatever the code is currently right now in the Linux kernel, and see if the fixes that have been done actually solve all our problems or not. And I hope not, that way the model will actually be useful. Um, and finally, you can yeah, bring a bit of uh, lessons that I've learned. So as I said, it's my first experience with TLA Plus. It's also my first experience with KVM and the Geek, because I learned all of this at the same time. And so because of that, it's very easy to fall in what I call the one-to-one -one matching between code and model pitfall in that uh, initially, since I didn't really know the KVM, uh, well, KVM and the Geek well, I just look at what the code was and try to replicate everything that was going on. But what I actually needed is type a, take a step back and see what are really the logical steps. So I didn't need to emulate all of those loops to fit the list register. It's just one step that says well, you update the list registers and do it all at once. Um, Another thing I've noticed is yeah, large tracebacks are not always easy to analyze. So these 150 steps that take me to this failure are actually difficult to analyze. So usually you say, well, you have your model, and then you find a problem. It's easy. But sometimes the other half of the work is actually understanding what the, the trace is about. And uh, yeah, there were a few plus curl and tier plus issues I encountered, but I think we have a section at the end of the workshop to talk about that. So we can go to questions now. Thank you.